Sure. Thank you very much for, for joining me today. I know some people are kind of looking at the arrive can thing in the rear view mirror, but we, you know, it, it's, uh, it was a policy that really had some impact on a lot of people and uh, we can't let them just get away with it and, and push it under the rug. So perhaps just as a start, if you could introduce yourself, you're the lit litigation director with the Democracy Fund and, and you're following up on the Arrive Cam? That's right, Corey. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am the litigation director at the Democracy Fund. We are a civil liberties organization. We're a charity and we uh, challenge the government when we suspect there have been charter breaches or civil rights violations. And we did that with uh, Arrive Can back in August of uh, 2022. Now, as you probably know, um, Corey, about a month after we brought that application, the federal government rescinded all COVID-19 related border measures. What they're now trying to do is to say that because they've rescinded all those measures, our application, our court challenge is moot because there's nothing left to decide, but we don't agree with that. Well, no, I mean, you still, just because you stop doing it. I mean, if I'm doing something wrong and I've been doing it for a long period of time, you'd say it was criminal. I mean, we're not talking about a criminal thing in this, but if, if that was the case, you don't say, oh, well, I've stopped doing it, so you don't need to pursue charges any further. Well, no, the act was still committed and there still has to be some some consequences or follow-up on, on what happened. I mean, uh, for them to just say, well, we've turned the page, we can forget about it. It sounds pretty unreasonable. That's right. And, you know, uh, Corey, if, it's, if there is a charter breach happening, if there is an um, a breach to your privacy rights under Section 7 and 8 of the Charter, the fact that that information has been compelled under threat of, const uh, of prosecution and it's, it's being retained and retained indefinitely and potentially shared uh, constitute in, constitutes, at least in our view, an ongoing breach. This is not something, it's not the sort of uh, thing that the government can fix by simply rescinding the arrive can requirement so where is your action at, at this point then it's going you're making an application to a court or it's already in progress uh, where are things sitting right now well it's already in progress as i said we issued the application with the federal court of canada and that was in august of 2022 but because the um the measures were rescinded shortly after that we're now um appearing before a court to argue whether or not our application should proceed. Uh, so that's where we are. But Corey, there's another part of our application. And I think this hasn't been really widely discussed in mainstream media or, or very much at all. And that is the question of whether a RiveCan was actually legally required of persons traveling the border, um, at least for part of that period from October um, 2020, when they first started the requirement up until October 2022, when it was rescinded. And that's one of the things that's very unique about our application. We're actually saying that for a period of time there, um, ArriveCan was not the law because the government made a mistake. Or if it was the law, they haven't been transparent about it. And we're asking them to prove to us that they've taken the requisite steps under the order in, orders in council to make ArriveCan legally binding. Yeah, well, a lot of pandemic measures, I mean, they, they certainly use the justification of an emergency to bring in orders and counsel and things to slide under the radar so they wouldn't face the scrutiny of our legislators before they got brought into place, which I, I believe, yeah, it does make it all the more important Then, if we couldn't do it at that time, then we should be giving these, these actions and measures scrutiny now uh, rather than saying, you know, if, well, it's just a done deal. Right. Corey, you bring up a very important point. And that point is that Arrive Can was not passed into law in the ordinary way that we were used to, right? We're used to laws being passed um, by the legislature, legislative branches of government after some debate in, in the legislature or in parliament. But Arrive Can came about in a very strange way. And if, if you'll indulge me for just a moment here, uh, we have legislation, it's called the Quarantine Act. And under the Quarantine Act, the governor and council can make um, certain orders, if they're satisfied, certain conditions exist with respect to a communicable disease. And they did that. And they, they, they issued these orders in council from October 2020 to October 2022. These are supposed to be the origins of ArriveCan. This is supposed to be the legal um, foundation for ArriveCan. But here's the problem, Corey. Those orders 
don't mention ArriveCan. You will not find the word ArriveCan anywhere in those orders. Those orders only say that the Minister of Health will specify an electronic means by which certain information must be provided. Where did the Minister of Health do that? That's one of the questions we have for him. And, and you have that document. I believe you sent it to us uh, w w from the Public Health Agency of Canada. So, I mean, it, it's it's documented with this uh, unusual measure and move with, with what they've done. Uh, I, I imagine it would take the power of the court to start making them explain themselves on this. Right. And this document is critically important, um, Corey, because if you look at the bottom of that document, I don't know if you can see it, but it's dated November 26th, 2021. Now, this is a document where the designate of the Minister of Health is specifying elect arrive can as the electronic means required in the orders, but it's a year late. They were supposed to make this specification in November of 2020. And I can't find any other document like this anywhere in which the Minister of Health or his designate specifies arrive can. And I can be proved wrong, but I don't think it exists. So uh, just on to, uh, I want to kind of turn a little bit. Uh, you, you'd mentioned on, on the way uh, your organization's kind of got a, a unique approach to it. I'm just wondering, the JCCF just announced that they're uh, launching a, a, some sort of legal action re with regards to the ArriveCan uh, app as well. Are, are you guys working in conjunction? Are these uh, parallel sort of actions? I mean, uh, is it kind of is more the more the merrier on this? Uh, I'm just wondering what's the going on. I didn't really see the JCCF one too closely because that just came out. Well, so the answer is yes and no. We're, we're great fans of the JCCF at the Democracy Fund. We both issued our Rive Can applications separately, but on or about the same day. And they have been joined up by the Federal Court of Canada because they do that um, for a variety of reasons. Because if two people challenge the same law, they want to make sure that the decisions are consistent. So in that way, um, we are together with the JCCF, but I also understand that the JCCF has now filed a lawsuit uh, for damages relating to ArriveCan, and that is not something uh, that we have any part of, but we wish them the best of luck with it. Yeah, so that, that's something I wanted to move on to, uh, you know, was, was asking you, what are you seeking from the government? So, I mean, if not damages, then just, uh, I guess, a, a ruling to at least sanction the government or to at least you know, state that this that there was things done incorrectly or, or violating people's charter rights? We're seeing declarations, but there, there's, there's an important point here because if we're right that ArriveCan wasn't properly specified between November 2020 and November 2021, that means that anybody who's charged with it um, shouldn't have been and that any tickets that they were issued, they shouldn't have been prosecuted for. And those people will have a great defense if we're right. And they will possibly also have some other uh, recourse if they've paid the fines. There's also a question about what happens uh, with people who were compelled to provide their information under um, threat of prosecution to uh, the Minister of Health through a RIVCAN. If a RIVCAN wasn't the law for that period of time we're discussing, then that's an unreasonable search. It's an unreasonable seizure. Yeah, I mean, it, boy, you know, it just gets so convoluted. I mean, we really suspended our our protections and, and our means of properly, you know, creating and, and applying laws throughout this. And as you said, so were there a large number of people who faced then some charges or fines or sanctions because of uh, not using a rive can or, or not properly, uh, as far as the government's concerned, taking part in it? Well, the government has said, in a, at least they've told the CBC, that about 190 people have been charged with, um, directly charged with not using a RIVCAN when they crossed the Canadian border. Uh, that was in August of 2022, so I don't know if there were others charged after that. I don't have that information. But these charges are significant. They're over 5000 in some cases over $6,000. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a very serious uh, sanction against somebody. I mean, even if, well, even if they do have the means to shrug that off, I think most of us don't. It's, it's certainly a matter of principle. Again, especially if you were charged with something that wasn't actually a law. I mean, it's kind of bizarre. 
Right. So, you, you know, we and, and let's get back to that point of whether or not it was the law. Because, you know, Corey, I can't find it. I've looked for it. I have made requests to the Minister of Health. I've made requests to the Deputy Minister of Health. I've made requests to the Public Health Agency of Canada. I have asked lawyers for the Attorney General to get me the proof that Arrive Can was specified as the electronic means by which people have to provide this information. Back in November of 2020, nobody's giving it to me. And that's one of the things we're trying to get out of this lawsuit. We're trying to get that proof. Now, the government could very easily refute me. They could just give me the information that I've been asking for. But why is it so hard to find? And why won't they give it to me? Well, so, I mean, uh, can the courts compel the government to come up with these? We, we know the government, if they don't want to provide documents, boy, they can sure twist themselves into knots and make up reasons for, oh, public health or security or whatever reason as to why uh, we, we don't deserve to know what they actually did. Well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, Corey. If the if the Minister of Health succeeds in having our application struck for mootness, they won't have to give us that information, not through this court proceeding anyway, uh, but we will find some way to get it. Oh, I don't doubt it. You, you, your, your organization and yourself have been very persistent on, on this and, and other issues and, and you know, some of your, your testimony in, in other areas on this, this whole pandemic thing. I mean, we're in the phase. I, I think the government really wants us all to forget about it. You know, they, they, they want the, the hopefully we'll see what ha- comes out from the, the Rulo report and, and they'll, they'll want to pretend it's, it's all done with. But boy, we turned our nation upside down for three years. I, I want some answers. I'm certain a lot more Canadians do as well. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It seems like Arrive Can is just one of the, the many things that have uh, gone wrong with our, our nation and since, uh, since 2020. And um, at least I think, I think it's, it's one of the many things that have gone wrong with our nation. And I'd, I'd like some answers and some accountability for uh, what seems to me to be uh, an unprecedented disregard of our rights. Yeah, so what sort of timeline are you looking at right now? I mean, the courts can, of course, can be agonizingly slow. Uh, you've been in the process for some time already. Is, is uh, th- there's some resolution in sight down the road? Well, so what, what's, what's happening now is it's a motion. And a motion is when one of the parties asks the court to do something. In this case, the uh, attorney general is asking the court to strike our application. So to make it go away entirely, uh, they've had to file materials. They've done that. We filed uh, responding materials. If anybody wants to see them, they can go to our website, which is um, thedemocracyfund.ca. And now the uh, the attorney general will have a chance to respond to us. I think they have until February the 15th to do that. And then uh, the court will make a decision. And if they decide the application is moot, that's the end of it. If they don't decide that the application is moot, but that it can proceed, um, then we'll get a uh, disclosure and we'll go on to argue uh, the merits of the application. Yeah, so while, while I've got you, the, the Democracy Fund, uh, you guys have other, you know, actions and, and uh, items that you're working on as well. Uh, what, what other um, things have you guys got on your plate right now? Well, we just wrapped up the, uh, the public order emergency inquiry, as you, um, uh, you referred to. Uh, we're representing uh, dozens of people who have been criminally charged uh, in the um, uh, w- with respect to the freedom uh, convoy protests across Canada, we have uh, probably a couple of thousand at least uh, uh, individuals who are representing have been charged with quarantine act offenses or other COVID related measures across the country. Um, and, and you know we we represent other people as well. Sometimes through our in house counsel, sometimes through trusted counsel whom we. Uh, we use. Uh, recently, we uh, were defending uh, Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky um, before the um, the courts in Alberta, and uh, Sarah Miller was our lawyer for that. Okay, great. Well, uh, so, I mean, you mentioned it's, it's democracyfund.ca, uh, and that's where people can reach out to you. I mean, if they need legal representation or if they want to support you guys and, and your work, uh, are there other areas where they can uh, help you guys out? Well, you know, I think that's that's it. We're we're an organization that doesn't take any money from the government. If they would like to um, to support us, we always appreciate that because that's the only way we can do our work. Um, if somebody has a, a legal problem and it falls within our mandate as a charity, 
uh, then we'll look at that problem and we'll see if we can help. Great. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on to talk to us today about what you guys have been doing. And I do appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, you know, organizations like yours, uh, as you said, the, the government's certainly not going to help you out when the government's been the one that, that's uh, been infringing on people. We, we kind of need to, to help ourselves. And as you said, we need to support groups like yours in order to do that and make sure our, our rights are maintained. So uh, thank you again for, for coming on. And I, I really hope you can get some answers through this, this action on the Arrive Can. Well, thanks, Corey. And it's been a pleasure. Great. Right, thank you. I'm sure we'll talk again. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited access. 